Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and I'm here with my week of reading wrap-up, where I talk about what I read last week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. So delighted to say that I'm finally caught up and able to return to my regular schedule of posting. Uh, so thank you for bearing with me as it took me a while to get back on my feet. But let's jump right in with the books that I'm that I finished last week. So the first thing that I finished, uh, and this was a little while ago, so this is, wasn't technically last week, uh, but this is something that I'm reading with my very dear friend Leo of Leo's Little Book Life of Instagram, and big announcement, he's coming back to YouTube. Yes, he's coming back to YouTube. So I'm, I couldn't be more elated and excited. Uh, he has recently been re-inspired to uh, come back. And if you've watched any of my videos, you know I talk about him incessantly because we constantly read together. Uh, but he's been on Instagram this whole time. But I just think his voice and what he, his material and what he reads and how he critiques books is just so eloquent, so smart. And he, he was, I, I just missed him on booktube. I just think he has um, such a way of phrasing things. And I know I get access to him all the time because we've never stopped reading together. But I'm just delighted that others will be able to watch his, his uh, booktube channel again. So he's turned it back on. So all the videos that he previously had that he just put into private have been released again out into the world. Um, so please go ahead and, and check him out. Uh, we are reading the Rougon Macar series together. This is by, by the French writer Emile Zola. I started it, was raving about it so much that he picked one up and said, okay, I'm in, let's catch up. So we caught up and we, this is the one that we caught up with. And this is uh, the fourth one. This is Conquest of Plaisance by Emile Zola. This is translated by Helen Constantine, and it's an Oxford University Press edition. Uh, Leo has these phenomenal editions that are all in Dutch with like the sauciest covers ever. And that's really apropos. I mean, these don't do anything to tell you how uh, interesting Zola is as a writer and how how um, psychologically deep he goes and how shocking and scandalous uh, some of his material is. Um, the Rougon Makar series, in case you don't know, is where he takes the naturalist approach, which was very popular in France at the time, and really you know, assumes that uh, certain traits run in the bloodlines and um, genetic uh, predisposition to certain behaviors. And he plays this out through this family and all of their descendants. In this one, we have uh, what was a, just a hysterical setup. And I just laughed uproariously through, I would say, the first half to, to two thirds of the book. Um, in this book, he's taking on gossip, um, uh, kind of salacious, slanderous rumors. Uh, specifically with religion and politics and a little bit of society. So uh, the setup is you've got cousins who married each other uh, of the both the Rougon and the Makar side of the of the of the family that we're that we're looking at, and we have Francois Moret and his wife Math, and uh, they're a seemingly normal family. Uh, upper middle class. They live in this beautiful home, uh, this gorgeous garden, and they live next to uh, two politicians. Uh, they everything seems pretty normal, pretty pretty fine. Everything's as it as you would expect it in in this type of of family. Uh, but he, you know, Moray is a stubborn, prideful man, and he likes to be seen as ruling the roost. And he does something that has profound implications on his entire family and the, the village that they live in, in Plassans. He, uh, without telling his wife, he makes the decision to rent out one of their upstairs rooms. And he rents it out to a priest and the priest's mother. 
And this is shocking to Moth. She didn't expect this to happen. She's not prepared for it. The room isn't ready. And all of a sudden this is kind of foisted on her. Uh, she's very upset about this, as you can well imagine. And this priest is kind of odd. He's haughty. He's very standoffish. He has a sinister air about him. He's quiet and somber. And then the, the mother is just the same, if not worse. Uh, she kind of recedes into the background and is always watching like a protector of this grown man. <laughs> so they're quite, a car they're, they're quite a pair. There seems to be an air of suspicion about and some rumors and some unclear understanding of where this priest has come from. Where was he before? Why is he not there? What is he doing here? And Moray takes on a, a campaign to make sure that he's seen as respectable and he gets a leg up in the small town. And a little bit of it is to uh, kind of get under the skin of his mother-in-law, who likes to think that she rules the salon, has the most important salon in town. Uh, it's a hard job because this priest is so weird and he's so awkward and doesn't really like people. And it's evident in how he interacts with everyone. Uh, so that's, that is in and of itself hilarious as that setup is started. Uh, but by giving him so much power, uh, slowly the priest starts to take a foothold in the home and in the town, in the village, and then also in politics. And what happens most uh, noticeably is Ma's conversion from a true atheist to a devout, almost obsessive believer. And that has serious repercussions through the entire family in the home. Uh, and, and yeah, disaster lurks. Uh, the fascinating setup. Uh, again, that last chapter was masterful. There's scenes that I will never forget. And it was a good, it was a good slow burn, this one, without a doubt. Next up, I wanted to read something for Spinster September. And um, that's something that's put on by, no by Nora at Pear Jelly at Instagram. And this is just taking off, which it delights me to no end. And I have a set of books uh, that I have been meaning to read the full series. And I'm just kind of taking it little by little because they're fun and light. And this is the Map and Lucia series. I've got these gorgeous editions, really fun editions that uh, Nancy Mitford wrote the introduction for. And uh, if you know me at all, you know that I, I have a thing for the Mitford family. Uh, I'll speak a little bit more about that a little later. Uh, but this was the first one, Queen Lucia, uproariously funny. And then this was the second one that I read this time. And this is Miss Map. Now this is part three, but I have seen it also written as part two. So I think they are not fully in chronological order. I think you can read them out of order. If anybody knows specifically, please let me know. Um, and while this was very, very amusing as these are, uh, it wasn't as uproariously funny as Queen Lucia. In this edition, we're in this tiny little village of Rysolm, and this is a community of uh, kind of rich people outside of London. And uh, think of this as housewives, <laughs> but not housewives, like the spinsters of Rysolm. Uh, so there are a bunch of women who are wealthy and they want to seem uh, very uh, chic in vogue. They want to seem au courant, but uh, they make silly mistakes. Uh, there's all sorts of miscommunications. They're always trying to um, spy on each other and see who's doing what. All these silly things and silly games. And so that's really at the heart of these books. In this book, we have Miss Map, and she is an heiress and she has a beautiful, beautiful home. And she has two neighbors on either side that are both retired officers. And she's constantly fascinated. And it, it seems like there's a lot of slim pickings in this town. And so she is trying to pitch herself to be the new misses of either of them. Uh, so to, to hilarious consequences. So this was light, it was fun, um, but I didn't find it, as I mentioned, as amusing as, amusing as Queen Lucia. 
Uh, and, you know, sometimes I've, I have to be in the right mood to read about rich people problems because <laughs> I don't always find it to be as amusing. But um, if you want something inconsequential, light palate cleansers, these are great. Next up, there's an author that I find very interesting. I don't always agree with her. I prefer her essays and her nonfiction to her books other than her first one. So I was a little hesitant, but this came up in my library hold and it was an audiobook narrated by her. So I decided to take a, take a leap. And this is The Fraud by Zadie Smith. Now I remember being in London in the summer and I had a gorgeous afternoon with Eric Carl Anderson and we went to the National Gallery and then we sat and had a gorgeous tea at the Dalloway Terrace. It was just a fantastic day. And he was telling me about talking with Zadie Smith and reading this book. And he piqued my interest, I'll, uh, I will say that. I mean, first off, it's historical fiction, which I, I like that genre very much. So I, I was like, okay, well, let me, let me take another try, another crack at uh, Zadie Smith. And what my challenges tend to be with her fiction is um, sometimes she will start us with a, a, a certain point of view, and then she will veer off. And often she veers off to a point of view that I find less interesting than the one we were in. So I was really hoping that wouldn't happen. Unfortunately, it did again here, but to less dire consequences. Maybe it was because I was listening to the audio and she has a velvet voice. I mean, just gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, warm, deep voice. And I really liked her take, her take of the different accents. So I think that helped. So the book is set in 1873 in London, and we are following in the point of, in the point of view of our narrator, who is Mrs. Eliza Touche. And she has a very interesting past, and she's a very capable woman, wholly underutilized in her life. She is a widow. Uh, she married a man uh, who uh, then was thought to be dead, and taken in by his cousin. And she proceeded to have a relationship with this man, uh, but she's living in his home and kind of a de facto secretary, housekeeper, assistant kind of, kind of role. Meanwhile, he has married and he married a, a young, uh, sassy, really pretty, but Air, uh, kind of um, tardy young thing named Sarah. And he is a writer. Unfortunately, he's not a very good one. He writes novels and they're boring. And she, she is, Eliza's there to kind of help him with his manuscripts, help him uh, with research, just kind of help him. And sometimes she even does some of the writing herself. So as I said, she's capable, but under, under uh, appreciated. Uh, she, there's a trial that ha that that comes up in the paper that kind of captures all of London, and it is about this man who claims to be the missing uh, heir to this fortune, and he has come back to claim the inheritance. And people are saying that it's no way. There's no way this person is is who he says he is. And one of there's a ton of witnesses. Uh, there is a huge trial. It becomes this. Uh, thing in the papers, the the public becomes completely engrossed in it, and all of this is true. And she also becomes engrossed in this, as well as Sarah. And so they start going to the trial to be there and watch this all happen. And as she's sitting there, she's fascinated with uh, what people what people are believing and who's believing what story, and why why don't they all see the things in the same way? So things that are very obvious to her are very different to Sarah uh, and are very different to some of the other people in, in the courtroom. And she becomes particularly interested in this gentleman, Bogle. And Bogle is a freed slave, a slave uh, man who was raised in Jamaica and who is one of the star witnesses for this man who claims that he is the missing heir. And 
Uh, so we learn a lot. We we spend a significant amount of time understanding Eliza and her thinking, her relationships, uh, her aspirations, her kind of thwarted ambitions. Uh, and then I would say maybe two thirds through the book, we have her sit down with Vogel. And then all of a sudden the book takes a turn. <laughs> that turn was coming and we go back into Vogel's life. Um, I really wish the anchor had been in, in kind of grounding the story or bringing that story in earlier and connecting them. Um, because it did make me feel like, well, wait a minute, I want to go back to Eliza. I'd like to understand what's still happening there. But meanwhile, we're kind of detoured. It does draw back in and she does kind of, um, reunite all characters and, um, uh, and wraps it up for us. And so in that way, I, you know, I didn't love it, but I liked it more than I've liked some of her previous ones. I think, I think the 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 audio narration did it for me. I think that's the the saving grace for me in this one. So I would love to know if you've read this one and what your thoughts were. Then another book that I read for Spencer September is one that I have been meaning to read forever, and this is by one of those um, mid century women writers that I found fascinating. I think she writes between the wars. Uh, her name is Molly Keene. And I've seen Good Behavior forever and I've, I've meant to read it. Well, this was my time. And I'm telling you, I was not prepared. <laughs> I was wholly unprepared. I really thought I was going to be getting this kind of almost similar to Miss Map, this frothy, you know, uh, maybe good, maybe good girl gone a little bad and a little wild a little bit. No, 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 that's not what I got here. This is a bitter, dark revenge tale set in Ireland at one of the big mansion, the big grand homes uh, that is slowly falling into um, disrepair. We meet a, our 57-year-old narrator, a woman named Arun, as she is in the kitchen making a dish that the cook is adamant should not be served to her dying mother. Uh, Arun is making, a, dis, it sounds disgusting, it's a rabbit mousse. And um, she's determined that she's gonna make this. She's very uh, specific uh, and she has a lot of ideas about what she understands to be her mother's tastes and the overstepping that is done by uh, Rose, the, the cook, slash nurse slash housemaid. So it's really a battle of the wills between these two women at the opening of this book. And sure enough, she gives it to her mother and her mother is so mortified and just the smell of it. Uh, she doesn't even, I think, get that far in eating it and she dies. Uh, and we, what we end up getting is then this backstory of her life and this really true sense of a revenge story of a young woman who had um, a mother who was very distant, artistic, um, rich, haughty, um, completely disinterested in family affairs, just wanted to do her odd paintings and garden, uh, a father who loved her but was always inappropriate with women, uh, not inappropriate with her, but uh, but she was a, a plain and also very tall and overweight girl. And that really led to how she was perceived by the world. She had an older brother that she loved very much and he ended up having a very close relationship with her. He comes back from Cambridge and he brings his friend, Robert, and uh, they all kind of de develop this threesome that do things together. But one of the things that makes Erin so interesting is the way that she doesn't realize what's happening around her. And you have to wonder if it's a case of naivete uh, is it ignorance? Because she truly doesn't have any friends. She doesn't have, she's not in society. Uh, the family doesn't have a lot of money. And so they don't socialize very much at all. 
and or is it willful disregard um, and just not wanting to see? And so this book has is one of the the brilliant things about the book is all the things that we are kind of hinted and win and winked at as we're reading through that is not overt. It's not straight out said, but you know that she doesn't get what's happening around her. And then you get to see her make decisions that we know are going to have bad, bad consequences for her. Really bad consequences for her. Now, I have seen some people say that this is wickedly funny. I didn't find it funny at all. I thought it was really dark, um, a little depressing, but the writing is so, so good. And it definitely speaks to a place and time in Ireland, this kind of fraying of of um, of money and what the uh, aristocracy were doing, how they were handling it, if they were handling it at all. Uh, so I thought this was fantastic, really great for Spinster September. And it definitely gave me like Midford vibes, not as wacky witty as the Midfords are, but definitely that uh, out of touch uh, family that is just kind of doing their own thing and uh, with win dwindling funds, let's, let's say that. So yeah, really glad that I finally had the opportunity to get to Molly Keene. And I'm, I'm definitely not going to assume that any <laughs> more of her books are going to be light reads because this was not that at all. Okay, so that's what I completed. So let's talk about what I'm currently reading. For Women in Translation Month of, of Rollover, uh, women, if you don't know, Women in Translation Month is usually August. <laughs> I didn't get to it in August, so I'm moving it to September. And that's done by Maytel Radowitz. And uh, she's done a great job at creating this month of reading. And uh, I just am so excited by Women in Translation uh, that I just, I usually read Women in Translation, but I wanted to spend significant time with it. And so this is something I'm reading for Shorty September as well. Shorty September put on by Heather, Sean, and Bert. Heather from Soggy Expat Book Nerd and Sean and Bert from Past Story Time. And this is A Little Luck by Claudia Pinheiro. This is translated by Francis Riddle. Um, I haven't gotten that much further. I'm about a little to the halfway point. Uh, and this is already very claustrophobic. I'm worried about this character. Um, we have a woman who something horrible happened to her when she was younger, uh, and she has left Buenos Aires and been in the United States. She's had facial reconstruction and she has wears um, contacts to make her eyes different. And she now has a job which has brought her back to her, not just Buenos Aires, but to the neighborhood the actual neighborhood that she lived in, the school that she used to go to, uh, to do a specific job. And she's running into people who have a key to what happened to her and what she went through. And so we're slowly coming to grips and starting to see what actually has transpired uh, that made her leave and why she's anxious in coming back. So um, I love how Claudia Pinheiro writes, and this is no exception. So looking forward to getting in, into a little bit further into this. I made mention that um, Leo and I are continuing on with the Rugal Makar series. This is the next one. This is, I think, the fifth one, The Sin of Abbe Moré. Uh, and this is a translation by Valerie Minogue. Now, uh, so this Abbe Moray is the priest, the son of Math and Moray that we met in the previous one. So he's become a priest and he's in for it. He's about to sin. <laughs> and uh, I think that's going to drive him mad. And FYI, madness runs in his family. So um, this has so much nature writing. Uh, maybe a little too much. Um, we're halfway through. I owe Leo a check-in, so I'm teeing this one up immediately after I end this end editing this video and getting it up. Uh, so we'll see. This is heavy, heavily influenced by Adam and Eve. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll have more to speak about this uh, hopefully next week.
Then I mentioned uh, last time that this one also, just like the Molly Keene uh, Good Behavior, this one shocked me too. This is Lightning Rods by Helen DeWitt. This is a satire. I'm reading this as part of the Helen DeWitt Author Spotlight series that I'm doing with a group of amazing people. And uh, this is just really, um, this is satire at its, I would say at its, one of its highest levels. Um, it is taking on a question of sexual harassment in very bold, very provocative, uh, shocking ways. And um, yeah, I, I still don't like satire. Uh, I, can, I can tell you that, but I see what she's doing. Um, what we're finding, uh, we just had our third check-in, uh, so next week we'll wrap it up. What we're finding is there's not a lot to talk about because satire is kind of one, one note all the way through. So we're not getting character development. We're not getting, you know, rich scenery. We're getting kind of the prolonged joke, the elongation to its final conclusion of the of the ridiculousness of this premise and seeing and seeing how far she's going to take it. Uh, you know, like I said, she's she's a masterful writer, uh, but who this is some interesting material to be to be reading. Uh, yeah, stay, stay tuned for my wrap up of that next week. And then I have over here behind me, I have a bunch of books for uh, Shorty September that I've queued up and waiting to go. So I'm gonna kind of dip in something from there and continue on with that. So look forward to uh, speaking with you next week and seeing which of those I picked. And in the meantime, I would love to know if you've read any of these books, what were your thoughts? And I hope that you have a great reading week ahead of you and I'll look forward to talking to you next week. Bye.